All right, so here we are for our May 2024 monthly market and economic update. Um, it's fair to say there's been a little bit happening over the course of the last uh, couple of months, but in a lot of ways it's also a bit of business as usual. More of the um, same. More yeah. of the same. Mm. Um, and, and I think because we go through similar themes each month, it's it allows us to be able to pick up on any sort of little incidental changes, yeah. um, of which there's been some, and I think we'll just take 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 everyone through that now. Um, so we're just working our way through here. Obviously, we always start with GDP growth. The GDP growth numbers here for our major trading partners, China and India, as well as the G3 economies, um, still show that GDP growth around the world is sitting you know, around about that you know, three, three and a half percent level. Mm. Um, obviously, some economies are faring better than others, um, you know, particularly, say, China and India. They've got some higher numbers than, say, uh, Europe and Japan, and US is sitting you know, around about that three and a half percent as well. Yeah. Um, but you know, as as time goes on, we start to see more and more and more. Uh, I suppose what's the impact of you now that post COVID time is having on on GDP around mm. the world. Mm. Um, but you know, for the time being, it's it's sitting pretty okay. Yeah, and in, and in particular, we were commenting earlier around the you know the the US. GDP, yeah, that's that's been holding quite firm. Yeah. Uh, so, it does. yeah, the commentary around that is is that uh, probably similar to here is that anticipated uh, rate reductions may have, may now be delayed or deferred. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we'll just wait and see um, on how all that plays out. And I, I note the I think the C, CPI numbers in the US. I know we're talking about GDP here, but the CPI numbers in the US are, are due tonight. So that. Yes, um, that will obviously give a steer as to how another update on on their economy and how that's going and, and their their tackle on inflation. Yeah, we do see markets really react sometimes mm. too, depending upon uh, what those how those numbers yeah. come out. Yeah, um, and that's again as we always say, that's that short term volatility rather than yeah. long term volatility. That's right. Um, and short term volatility, we're not too concerned about, but uh, there there is typically a reaction as a result of that. Uh, GDP growth in Australia, Andrew. You want to talk us through this one? Yeah, so uh, it, it has actually stalled a fair bit, uh, and we don't get the next release until early June. But certainly, the as previously commented, the September and December quarters were uh, relatively flat at 0.3 percent and 0.2 percent. Yeah, uh, and therefore the the one year numbers to December. Uh, we're about one and a half percent. So obviously, with a point three and a point two uh, for the previous two quarters, that that starts to highlight that yeah, GDP is is falling. Uh, when you take into account the uh, the impact of immigration and and the population per capita, uh, the numbers are actually negative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. So, which I think I know I always talk about this, but the 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 very large spikes that we saw here. Um, you know, obviously in COVID and then coming out of COVID, there's going to be a period of time where it's it's almost just rebalancing itself. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think both the Reserve Bank, the government uh, are considering what the future looks like. Um, I think it's, you know, relatively positive. Yeah. But um, there is going to be this rebalancing because there was such a dramatic change, such a dramatic event, but mm. also such a dramatic change to how economies are run and, and how we do business and yeah. all those sorts of things. So it's significant. And, you know, one of the implications with these these indicators is that there is a bit of a lag. So, uh, you know, we're in yeah, um, the middle true. of May. Yeah, and that's right. The, the most recent GDP numbers we have published uh, for the December quarter. Yeah. Uh, so there, there are various bits of data points that, that have a more recent uh, bend, I, I guess, on yeah. – um, What's happening in the economy and yes. CBA put out a, a monthly uh, household spending insights report. So their latest report, which covers April, uh, suggests that from January to, to now, or certainly for the first four months of the calendar year, that that spend uh, household and consumer spending is is down, is tracking down, uh, and that's in nominal terms. So again, when you account for uh, uh, real terms, the the decline is even more stark. So I right. think that's that points to things uh, that the, the measures that have been put in place and, and the tackle on inflation is would appear to be starting to, to be take hold. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
So we might actually change <coughs> tact a little bit here, and I know we'll come back to inflation shortly, mm. and that's, that's actually some really good points you just yeah. raised, and I'm keen to explore that a bit further. We, we, we like to talk about things in the longer term. Yeah. And one of the things we were chatting about the other week was the, the changing nature of the Australian economy. So you know, this, this slide here just talks a little bit about so the population back 10 years ago, so in March 2014, the population that we had uh, in Australia was 23 million. Now we've got 26.6 million people. So mm. we do have population growth coming, coming to the country, country, as you just rightly pointed out. Um, our export share by type, um, it's actually pretty similar to what it was 10 years ago. So yeah. manufacturing's dropped. Yeah, which is, bit. you know, what, what you would expect based on, uh, mm. you know, a lot of the economic commentary around um, domestic manufacturing. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, resources still sits about the same, maybe slightly higher. Yeah. It's not particularly unusual. Um, rural's dropped a little bit and services is the same. So yeah. Yeah. I just found these stats kind of interesting just to see – you look. You actually look at these back in the say the seventies and the eighties. Rural contribution was is, was forty or fifty percent of our mm. GDP, and, yeah. and and now of our exports. Sorry, and now it's it's only twelve percent. So, yeah. yeah, there's long term um, demographic shifts. I suppose yeah. that have an impact on this this data. But and I guess if you were to sort of make a, a trajectory, particularly on the population, so in another ten years' time, it probably implies that there'll be thirty million. Yeah, that's that right. Give or take. Yeah. Uh, but there, yeah, that's just interesting based on the last 10 years and the growth we've seen. So you roll for another 10 years. So we're possibly looking at the population size around. Yeah. There. I mean, and that speaks a lot to uh, housing affordability, mm. doesn't it? Yeah. So, yeah. You know, and as we were chatting about earlier and so on this next slide, the average price of a residential dwelling in Australia is $934,000 mm. as at the end of December 23. Yeah. Which is uh, which is quite large. It's a lot Dan, of money. Uh, yeah. Nudging a million dollars. Um, yeah. And if if you pair that back uh, and use you know compound, compound annual growth rate, it's about five point six percent, which is not not excessive, but that is double the yeah. the long term sort of trend of CPI. So it, it yeah that that does explain why it's now harder and harder to to afford to buy a house for particularly younger people. Yeah. Combine that with the, the you know, massive amount of debt you've got to take and uh, and the lev level of interest rates at the moment. Yeah. Um, and this always happens when we do these presentations. Yeah. I go off on tangents. But uh, the one of the things to think about here is the affordability of homes. Yeah. So if $934,000, let's say the typical bank wants a 20% deposit. Yeah. So you're yeah. looking at about $180,000 deposit, maybe a bit more, one ninety. dollars Yeah. That's that's what we're seeing more and more and more, and anecdotally, what we're seeing is is that's actually coming from the bank of mum and dad. Yes, more yeah. than, and, and maybe not all of it. Yeah. Maybe respectful there, but um, that's where that's coming from. And then the difference needs to be supported by a loan. Yeah, that's right. Now, yeah. if you've got a, what's that going to be about a seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar debt at current interest rates at seven percent. That's about fifty three, fifty four thousand a year in interest yeah. plus principal repayments, which yeah. Will, yeah. so your debt repayment is going to be about sixty thousand, sixty five thousand a year. Mm. That's um, it's a fair whack of household income. That is, mm. yeah, that is, that's right. Yeah. That's that's very significant. Yeah, so and and just to, to extend on that a little bit around you know parents potentially helping out, and clearly that there are parents that they can afford to do that, and they're happy yeah. to do that. But there's that's also right. parents that probably feel an obligation or pressure and they, you know, they, they want to do the right thing and yeah. help out their children but um, maybe at, at a detriment to, the, to their own sort of lifestyle. So it's, a, it's really it's a fine line. It's a balancing act, isn't it? Well, I think we're constantly giving advice on that, aren't yeah. we? Because um, uh, no, you, you specialise a bit with uh, ret retirement but, you know, that, that can have a really significant impact across someone's retirement yeah. it might mean that they don't get to go do the overseas trips or you know upgrade a new car or even you know go traveling in australia if they help their children out to that extent yeah, that's right and that's that's significant i think so that's yeah. part of what good financial advice is is trying to um get a good understanding of how that impacts yeah. you personally that's right all right uh back to cpi so cpi inflation in australia 
uh, obviously is sitting a tick above 3%, about 3.4 I think it is at the moment, um, which, you know, as I said last time I was on here, which was January, February maybe, uh, that that number is pretty – that's kind of okay. It's getting close to the band between 2 and yeah. 3%. Um, you know, we're obviously waiting for more data to come out as we always are, but – I know, Andrew, you've got some interesting st statistics around um, annual spending as well from the CBA. Yeah, so I touched on that a little bit earlier, but basically what, what we're saying is that that household spend uh, and consumer spend is is slowing down. Yep. So uh, for the, the 12 months to December, it was at 2.9%. At Roll forward four months, it's it's pulled back to 2.6%. Uh, and that's that's at a nominal level. And then... Underneath some of that data set, you then start to look at the way that CBA have, have uh, positioned some of the data and, and a new introduction for the April month was showing home ownership and how uh, the spend patterns uh, differ between those that have a home and those that don't or okay. will be rent and, and with a mortgage as well. So it's kind of pointing to almost a three-speed economy. So homeowners uh, without a mortgage... Uh, obviously don't, aren't feeling the real, you know, they're feeling cost of living pressures sure. but don't bear the, the brunt of the, the high interest rates on any debt. So mm. they've, they've got more more capacity to to bear rising prices. So their, their spending rate for the 12 months of April is uh, about 6.3%. So, so that's an increase by 6.3% on what they were spending last year. Yeah, that's right. Fascinating, yeah. right? Yeah. Right. yeah. So, and then the annual inflation rate is 3. Four, yeah, thereabouts. Yep. Okay, yeah. so that's almost double. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then you you look at uh, you pair that back and have a look at homeowners with a mortgage, uh, which is four and a half percent increase okay. in spend on the twelve months. Right. So not as not as high as as those without a mortgage, but uh, yeah, still still reasonably solid. And then you got renters that uh, are really dragging the, the 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 overall numbers down. So they're their spend growth in the 12 months has been 1.3%, so very subdued. And again, that's wow. in nominal terms. And if you strip out the impact of inflation, it's actually, yeah, renters are, are spending um, on an underlying basis a bit less. Yeah. Mm. Therefore, their position is 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 less than, say, yeah. uh, what inflation is at 3.4. Yeah. Mm. yeah. That's tough, isn't it? That's yeah. not – it's pretty sobering data, actually. Well, it then highlights the impact that, that – uh, yeah, we, we've heard a lot of commentary around it's, it's, it's the rental market's quite tough. Yeah. So rental prices have, have been skyrocketing. Uh, and then when when that's your your means of putting a roof over your head, it's it's pretty tough, isn't it? Yeah, that's that'd be very tough. Well, I think there's a one percent vacancy rate or something like mm. that. Yeah. Just... Okay. Uh, CPI inflation for the G3 economies. So we've got the United States, we've got Japan, and we've got Europe. And again, they're all sitting sort of slightly um, around that 3% mark. So it uh, looks like most of the hard work has been done um, in this period here, bringing back, bringing back the CPI numbers because they were way too high. Yeah, and that's that uh, very similar to the Australian uh, trend, isn't it? Yeah. It peaked and then it's it's taken a bit of a, yeah. a decline, yeah. uh, which is good. It's heading in the right direction. Uh, That's right. Challenge now is that it, it might just plateau for a little bit and stay elevated uh, above target for an extended period of time. Yeah. So I think we were chatting off air before around um, what the Reserve Banks do around the world with the interest rates. Mm. You know, so obviously in Australia, as I explained before, we've got home loan rates sitting about 7%. And that makes mortgage – having a mortgage – Pretty hard given yeah. the prices of properties um, and the amount of money you've got to earn to to pay back that mortgage. So, do you do we think that you know at any time soon we're going to see some sort of rate cuts or? Uh, you want to go out on a limb and do a prediction like the <laughs> RBA governor did a couple of years ago, Cam? <laughs> <laughs> nice segue. <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, there, there've been obviously again we'll touch on this. We're talking about this earlier, but they've been yeah. very cautious. They're sort of they are, you know. Not ruling anything in or out. Uh, the, the data would suggest that all the heavy lifting has been done and uh, hopefully the only way now is, is, is down as a matter of timing and when. Um, mm. I think the uh, 
Yeah, the, it would appear the economy is already, certainly the Australian economy is already hurting to a degree, so I think any further increases would uh, obviously um, increase the pain. Yeah. So hopefully the increases are, are finished, but uh, nothing will certainly guarantee. Uh, it's just, yeah, the timing on expectation around cuts and the, some of the commentary a few months ago started talking about, you know, one to three interest rate cuts this calendar year, yep. later in the year. Yep. Now the commentary slightly shifted to we might be lucky to see one um, and, and more than likely none So this, this calendar year. So it's, yeah, look, the data is continuing to shift and the, the commentary is shifting as a result. I just think the Reserve Bank, <laughs> uh, you, you referenced it earlier, but they've they put themselves in a bit of a hiding to nothing, so yeah. to speak, in the sense that they make some some really outlandish comments, um, which then prove to be incorrect, and then you know they it can then be held against them forever. Yeah. And Philip Lowe was um, was the person making those comments. So, so I think at the latest release, they said, "Oh, when what were the exact words? Or something like we don't want." Yeah, we're not ruling anything in or, in or out. out. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like the it's biggest nothing statement yeah. you can have. Yeah. Um, but that's okay because I think yeah. actually what they're trying to say, but they can't really say it, is we just we just want to wait. We just yeah. want to see what the data says. More data. And then, yep. Yeah, that's yep. right. Yep. Uh, okay, look, we go through this one each time. The, the one that I find really – or two things I find really interesting here, consumer sentiment. So we have started to see that come back up and that probably speaks a little bit to the, the data and the statistics you spoke about before from the CBA. Mm. Um, so we have started to see that consumer sentiment start to rise, uh, which is important because once consumers are feeling confident, they'll start um, spending money um, in the right places and that will then mean um, there'll be more investment, GDP growth takes hold. Uh, but the other thing that's really interesting on in these charts I find is the savings ratio. So obviously during COVID, when we couldn't spend any money, particularly down in, the, in Victoria and some of the other states, uh, our savings ratio just exploded when mm. we had a out of control, yeah. um, as did online orders, but couldn't keep up. So, uh, so it got up to around about sort of 20, 20% percent. But now the savings ratio, now that interest rates have a really bit, um, CPI is increasing, energy costs are increasing. Uh, our savings ratio has really dipped to a very low level. I think it's about two, two and a half percent. Yeah, um, and that includes superannuation, which is compulsory. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's there's some work that as an economy we've got to do there, but some of the stats we showed earlier is our household income as compared to um, where it was 10 years ago is actually at a really good position. And that was coming yeah. out of the GFC. Yeah. So there's nothing to be too concerned about with the savings ratio, no. I don't think. But no, no, uh, it's, it, it probably just, again, highlights the fact that uh, any, yeah, if there were to be any further rate increases, then, yeah, there'd be... A fair amount of pain because that's right. Yeah, that'd have to go into negative. Yeah, yeah. consumption's down. Yeah, our sort of disposable income's down. So it's uh, and and savings have been sort of run run dry. So I yeah. think um, yeah, you'd hope the damage has been done. Uh, business sentiment. So the NAB business survey uh, that we run through each time. So business confidence is sitting at a reasonable level. Um, I think again the interesting chart that I find here is around capacity utilisation. Most businesses seem to be fully at, at almost full capacity. Um, I know that's dropped off a little bit in the last sort of six, nine months, but it's still very high relative to the long-term trend. And and businesses uh, probably sort of six months ago were feeling more confident than they are now. So when a yeah. business, I guess directors of businesses feel confident, they'll, they'll do things, they'll invest money, they'll spend money. Uh, when they're less confident, then uh, that holds holds the economy back, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, look, unemployment still it's stabilised at around three point nine percent, which is well below yeah. the long term historical trend. So, yeah, um, I think the RBA may be looking to see what happens with that unemployment rate as well as another indicator, but it's it, it's it's holding quite quite steady around that just just under four percent. Um, as always, there's three scenarios that frame the global outlook. Uh, there's obviously the smooth rebalancing, which is what we feel like we're in. That that sort of, and I think that's the general consensus. That there's this nice rebalancing that occurs, um, and we start to see interest rates start to drop through um, to towards the end of the year. CPI drops, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, 
the, the major concern is obviously a major recession. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that whether we see a real reduction in GDP growth as a result of what might be a, a major recession around the world, this is. Um, and that's going to clearly impact global financial markets. Um, it's not what financial markets are uh, pricing in at the moment. No, that's right. Um, but that is, it is a risk, um, of course, as always. Yeah. Um, and then you know, the third option is just continued macro volatility. Um, and we saw probably a little bit of that macro volatility starting about four weeks ago. Yeah. Um, when the in the unemployment numbers, the uh, the PPI numbers and the services numbers didn't come out out of the US how people wanted them to, and equity markets responded negatively for, for a short period of time there since recovered. So, as always, the short term is is unclear. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. The longer yeah. term is where where if you hold a long term strategy, uh, allocations to growth assets and defensive assets that are at a risk profile that suits you, you end up with a better outcome so yeah. than trying to time uh, what we're all hoping for, which is a smooth rebalancing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yep. Uh, okay, so we've just got some data on uh, bond markets here. So the twelve month returns out of bond out of global bonds. Uh, are sitting at around about, or well, just a bit above zero. Um, this includes a lot of that volatility still in the in the price that we saw towards sort of the end of October. Um, markets have since recovered since then. Uh, similar similar thoughts for uh, the Australian bond market. It's currently sitting just a tick below negative. So bond markets are still um, they're holding their values, but they're still it's a bit tough. Yeah, uh, because of this. Yeah. Interest rate uncertainty. All the all the commentary around that. That's right. Yeah. So at some point, uh, when at some point when the economy starts going well again, interest rates will start falling, and at that point in time, that's when bonds will start to do spectacularly well. Yep. So don't jump out now. Is what oh, it's just. Well, I mean, yeah. it's just part of a long term yeah. strategy anyway. Yeah. So um, yeah, and it gives that real diversification effect yeah. that we we like to see. So. No, don't jump out. Yeah. Uh, equity market performance, on the other hand, have been, has been uh, very different, particularly globally. Um, so the so VTS there, which is the Vanguard US Total Market Shares Index, that's essentially the S and P five hundred, which is the US equity market in the main. Uh, over the course of the last year, that's up twenty six percent. So it's been a very very good time to be invested in global oh. equities, and yeah. uh, as we all know, we have quite a uh, significant, ex- significant exposure. Um, it's almost double what we have in Australian equities to uh, global equities. So it's been very good for our clients' portfolios. So that's been, a, you know, it's, it's wonderful then when that happens. Uh, obviously the the uh, the world index has almost mirrored um, the US index anyway, and that's mainly because Andrew, it's- About 70%, isn't it? That's yeah. right, yeah. yeah. Above seventy percent uh, of the of the global index is made up of the U.S. equity market. Um, interestingly enough, the the Australian equity market is is can I say only up nine percent? Still, still not a bad return. It's still it? not a bad yeah. return. But yeah. I, what it what it does do, Cam, it, it highlights the importance of being diversified. That's right. And yeah, we we have commented on this earlier uh, in other uh, monthly updates. But uh, yeah, just having that diversification means you can participate in that um, that global outperformance relative to the the local index. Yeah, that's right. Doesn't that's mean right. it's always going to happen, and and that uh, outperformance will be there. But it, it just it does highlight the the importance of of the, having that global reach. Yeah, look, Australian equities have an absolute place in client yeah. portfolios. Uh, they yeah. absolutely do, and um, you know, and it's also they have. Some idiosync- idiosyncrasies that mean that we get things like franking credits, mm. we get higher dividend yields, yeah. and 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 often if that's what you're after, then you'll have an over allocation to Australian equities. But but um, yeah, we we as you know, we like to diversify portfolios, um, and that diversification ends up usually in global equities. Yeah. Okay. Market timing. Oh, it just uh, it always has its place in in this update, doesn't it? Nothing. Nothing new. It's just. Uh, I guess it's just. It's a way to conclude uh, the investment approach and strategies to to stick to your strategy. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I guess I always like to include this as the last slide, and I'll 
tell everyone why, if you're still listening. Um, I like to include it because we all of what we've just talked about is very short term yeah. in nature. Yeah. Um, we include this slide because this is very long term in nature and how you actually make money is you are very patient over a long period of time. Um, so go through it very briefly. So that period from 1986 to you know, mid 2000s, 1200% return. That sounds okay. If someone's going to say, say to you, mm. would you be happy with that outcome? You'd probably say yes, right? Yeah, 100%. Um, mm. there, was a, there was a very brief, in this chart, a very brief period of time where markets fell. Yeah. And they fell by 48%. So that's significant. Yeah. It was a very brief period of time. So yeah. it takes a long time to go up and it's very quick to fall. Yeah, and I, I like the averages. So, I mean, that look, they are that their averages, obviously, but the, the bear's uh, average period is 0.9 of a year, right? Yeah. So it's uh, it's not a not a long time. Yes, there'll be there, there's longer uh, periods through history where yeah. markets are down, but as an average, that's in the context of that that time frame. That's that's really nothing. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, all right. So of course we finish with the disclaimer. Uh, the disclaimer just simply talks about that we haven't taken into consideration any personal objectives, financial situation or needs, uh, and we haven't given any securities advice yeah. at all. So you would need to get uh, complete advice or holistic advice from an independent financial advisor uh, to be able to rely, rely on that. Um, all right. Thanks so much, Andrew. I no, thanks, feel Dan. like I haven't done this for a few months and you know, hopefully that didn't show in the – in the presentation, but I think, yeah. I, and and smart in a new look, Cam, of course. Oh, thanks so much for bringing it up. <laughs> I really appreciate that. <laughs> uh, for those that are listening on the podcast, uh, we'll have we'll have the show notes as part of the podcast, uh, but you might want to jump on a YouTube and you can see my new look. I've managed to get myself a pair of glasses because I'm now not able to see as well as I could when I was a bit younger. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. See you soon. Bye.